Afternoon, everybody. Everybody successfully get themselves into a food coma? Yeah, if so, come to the right place. I'll let you take a nap while I talk. Um, my name is Shadwick Smith. I'm a senior cybersecurity analyst at Sutter Health in Sacramento, California. Um, Sutter Health has been undergoing a massive transformation in our cybersecurity group. We are in the process of building out an entire fusion center where we're taking our cybersecurity group, the physical security, our security operations, a lot of our IT, privacy risk management, and everything is being funneled in together. And we're spidering all of the information out to all the different groups. Um, and one of our initiatives in that is threat intelligence. Um, this is a relatively new area for us. We've only been doing it for about six to eight months. So I figured that I'd share some of the stuff that we have went through to develop our collection strategies and define where we were going with that. Um, how many people in the room are actually doing, actively doing threat intel currently? All right. Um, to give you an, a starter, um, one of the first things that we did with our threat intelligence program is developed our priority intelligence requirements. Um, these are the basic defining blocks of what we're going to gather for data to define the intelligence that we're going to feed into the different areas of the corporation. Um, the two major pieces that we do are technical tactical, which include our IOCs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, threat actor tracking. The other part of it is strategic. Um, a lot of the strategic goes into assigning risk to uh, vulnerabilities that are announced, evolving threats. Some of that threat actor tracking and how they are impacting our particular sector, which happens to be healthcare. Um, but we spread out quite a bit in healthcare because it is the most regulated industry. We have HIPAA, all of the finance stuff, Sarbanes-Oxley, Graham Levy, all of these different regulatory requirements. There's like 430 regulatory requirements that we have to abide to in healthcare. Um, so in defining those priority intelligence requirements, it can be really broad based. And if you get too broad based, you're looking at a lot of information. And depending on how big your cyber threat intelligence team is, it's gonna be overwhelming for them. So one of the main focuses for our collection strategy was to try to get our priority intelligence requirements narrowed down to a scope that we could handle. Um, currently, we have two threat intelligence analysts on our team. And when you look at companies, for example, like Palo Alto, who are seeing a million new samples a month, that's a lot of data to ingest. Um, so defining those down, getting our strategy in, and running that through the intelligence lifecycle, that was, these are our main priorities right now to get that narrowed down. Um, how we collect that data, we had to define that. What are we using to do that? What sources are we using? And after that, we have to define our periodic reviews of these to make sure that they're fitting business need. So PIRs actually ask the questions that define what we're actually going to gather for intelligence to help the corporation or the entity mitigate the risk and to minimize the impact from threats. So as we go through and define those priority intelligence requirements, underneath that we ask a whole lot of questions under those and those are our collection requirements. What we're doing to answer those questions. Um, the, those strategic level priority intelligence requirements, we use them to identify those questions then to define the data, and that goes to support our actual production of actionable intelligence. Um, the, with the intelligence life cycle, um, defining that in this will help kind of guide where we're going with that collection strategy. We start off with our planning and direction. Um, if you're starting out in this, spend the appropriate amount of time in this area. Get your planning and your direction done. Define what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it. Because that's your building block. 
If you don't spend enough time here, everything else in the life cycle is gonna fall apart. Um, after that, you have your actual collection. This is the data that you collect, where you collect it from. From there, once you get the data collected, you have to have people that are gonna analyze it and they're going to look through it and determine what actually is useful for the entity. After the analysis and production, we get into the reporting. What types of reporting are you gonna do? Where are you gonna do it? Who are you gonna disseminate that to? The dissemination of where that information goes to is a big definition because you need to get it into the hands of the people that actually make the decisions. And if you're getting it to the wrong people, it's worthless. And the last part of that, feedback. Always talk to the people that you're providing intelligence to and ask them if it's doing them any good and what they need. A lot of times they're gonna look at you and say, I don't know what I need. I want you to tell me what I need. You gotta work with them. You gotta ask them the questions and keep working through it with them to find out where their priorities lie. When you're looking at, from a strategic level, your CISO is trying to make decisions on where your program is gonna go, what kind of policies and procedures need to be in place, as opposed to your SOC analyst who's looking for IOCs, tactic techniques, and procedures so that they can actually identify the threats and map them to who they are, who it is that you're, is attacking you. If you send the information the wrong direction, it doesn't do you any good. So you gotta make sure and keep asking them questions so that you can further define what they're looking for. Um, planning and direction, as we talked about, it ensures the proper people. You get your processes, your technologies in place. That gets you your proper operation of your threat intelligence program and you build from there. Um, make sure you define what your objectives and who those key consumers are. Um, the PIR, PIRs that you have derived, make sure that you, again, I'm going to reiterate, make sure that you get those to your decision makers and they meet their needs. Um, and from there, continuous improvement. You're trying to get the guidance and then define new requirements and refine those requirements as time goes on so that you're producing actionable intel all of the time. Within the collection portion, um, we're gonna identify the sources at that point. The sources are somewhat going to be defined on what our intelligence requirements are and the questions that we're asking to meet those needs. We want to provide a full coverage of potential collection sources for ourselves. Some of those are open source threat intelligence feeds, um, whether that be IOCs or the tactics, techniques and procedures, blogs, news articles, vulnerability announcements. All of this stuff is freely available. You can find it. You just have to collate all that information and find out what's usable for you. Internal sources. Uh, can't stress this enough. When you're, when you're working with your security folk, when you're working with your networking folk, your server folk, all of the logs that you can collect, the more logs you can collect, the more internal data you have, the more actionable intelligence you have because these are things that are affecting your network every day. More internal sources is awesome. Get more internal sources. Vendor data. These are your external vendors. There are a lot of threat intel vendors out there. Many of them have different specialties. You have to go through the process of evaluating them and finding out what types of threat intel they provide and whether that's gonna fit with what you're looking for for your intelligence requirements. There are a lot of them that specialize specifically in deep and dark web. Some of them are looking at e-crime. Some of them track threat actors very well. Some of them are really good at providing on-time actionable IOCs. You have to decide where those sources are and which ones are providing you the best oh. intel. And the only way you can do that is to evaluate them. Next one is intelligence sharing partnerships. There are a number of Isaacs for any different number of verticals. If you get the opportunity to do that, join them. These are people who are doing the same thing you are every day in your space. If you can get into your Isaacs, get in there. There are people that you can contact when you're having troubles getting through process. Um, all of the stuff that I've learned has come from other people. Getting out, getting into that information sharing group, asking those guys questions. I'm like, hey, 
I don't know how to do this. What are you guys doing? When you get into the Isaacs, they're more than willing to share that information. When we get into the processing, processing, you're converting all of that raw intelligence into digestible formats. And that processing, again, you got to decide which direction that's going. Is it going to your technical people or is it going strategic up to your senior level management? Filter that data, compile it, centrally store it somewhere. If, if you're just starting out in this, a threat intelligence platform may not be an option for you. At that point, find a database, get some type of repository, whether that be some type of document repository like a wiki, anything that you can do to actually have somewhere to centrally store that data because you're going to reference that data a lot over time as you're evaluating different threats that are coming in. And that's where the last point comes in. Analysts can then compare the data from previous <coughs> campaigns and incidents within your environment to gain additional context on what they're facing today. The analysis and production cycle synthesizes all of that data. Um, the whole goal of that is to evaluate the reliability, the validity, the relevance, the timeliness of the data that you're getting to make sure that you're answering those primary intelligence requirements for your organization. Timeliness of data is a very important thing, particularly when it comes to IOCs. Today's threat actors are constantly changing what they're doing on a minute by minute basis. When you're having a particular phishing campaign, if they're actively monitoring it, they will actually change what their payload is within that. If they start out using our URLs, they might actually start throwing attachments on there as different things get blocked. They'll use revolving URLs. They'll change the URLs in the phishing campaign if they notice that they're getting blocked. So that timeliness of that data is very important. Um, and when you actually store that data, make sure you put it into logical sequence. Um, for global organizations, make sure you define a standardized time that you're going to use within your organization, particularly within your security group. Because if you're going over multiple time zones, what somebody posts as 1700 on Monday, oh, he's in the UK, that was 1700 UTC. 1700 in Pacific, that's seven hours later, that doesn't do you any good. So as you're going through this, make sure you standardize on a time set for what you're going to do for your logs and everything else. Dissemination, some of the dissemination, vulnerability reporting. Make sure you get your reports out on those vulnerabilities, evolving threats. Um, we routinely, on a weekly basis, are sending out somewhere around five to 10 reports outlining critical vulnerabilities that are affecting different devices within our environment. Um, with us, we have a lot of business devices. We also have a lot of medical devices. So we're watching all of these different feeds come in. We match them up with the vendors that we have identified that we have in our environment. And then we send that information out to the different IT teams and our biomed teams to make sure that it's valid. If it's not valid, we don't have to produce the report on it. But if that's a vendor we support, we're producing a report on it to let them know that it's there in case they missed it. Malware reporting. We work with our incident response teams heavily on this. As we see incidents that come in, they're writing up their reports on the incident. We're taking that data. We're collating that into monthly and quarterly trending. So the incident response reporting, that's another place. That's another source of data for us in our collection strategy. We utilize those reports heavily because that gives us trending that we can send up to our strategic teams, senior leadership. It also gives us a lot of IOCs on active threats in our environment. That is the most valuable intelligence you can have. Threat actor reporting. This is mostly strategic. However, our technical teams also use this because if they see certain tactics, techniques, procedures in attacks that are going on in our environment, they can actually map those back with where we've collated our data and identify different threat actors that are utilizing those particular TTPs 
and potentially map to who it is and utilize that information to see what other types of exploits or malware they're using and potentially identify additional threats beyond the one that they're looking at in their incident response. Uh, campaign reporting, mostly strategic again. We go over the different campaigns, everything that affects our environment, we report on it. We do trending, we do tracking on that, and we send it up. Again, this is heavily reliant on our SOC, our incident response teams. We also rely on our Isaacs. Other organizations that are seeing those same threats, they're reporting them in. We count that as an incident. We start tracking all of those. That becomes trending for our actual vertical. Strategically, our senior leadership wants to know that. Most senior leadership does. They want to know what their threat profile is. And as I have been talking about extensively, incident reporting. In the collection planning, identifying those CRs, those collection requirements, those are the questions that are gonna guide that collection process. Determine what those sources are, create the source portfolio. We actually have a cumulative list of all of the sources that we're utilizing. We map those to the different PIRs and where they actually answer those questions to give us that priority intelligence. Make sure you map your sources because you want to have at least two sources for every one of your collection requirements to be able to provide at least partial answers for it. That way you have a redundancy. You don't have a single point of failure in your intelligence program. Conducting the vendor evaluations in that planning process. Again, threat intel feeds, threat intel platform. If you go into those different areas, whether you are utilizing all open source, there are a number of threat platforms that actually offer a community edition where you can actually put your threat data in. Look them up online. There's a number of them that do it. Uh, collection operations. Um, the initiation of those source data collections. Where are you bringing them into? How are you collecting that data? Once you have that defined, start bringing in the data. Store your results, get them put into the knowledge bases, keep up to date with your evolving threats, proactively address social engineering techniques. These are one of the primary points of impact within most organizations today. Phishing, uh, fake tech support scams. These are all big things. We see about 90% of our incidents revolve around social engineering stuff. Pay attention to all the security layers, servers, switches, workstations, everywhere that you can be on your border, your DMZs, collect data from everywhere you can. Um, continuous maintenance within the operations. We go through on a regularly set schedule of every three months to reevaluate our collection requirements and make sure that they are properly answering in a and identifying that intelligence that we have to provide to people. When they're telling us, this is what we need, we want this information, we have to review that. We continually go through this. It's a regular cadence for us. Every three months, we reevaluate our collection requirements and our pri priority intelligence requirements. If something's not providing us the right data, we make a change to it. It's just the process to go through. Always, always improve your processes. Make sure that everything is supporting the business. When you go through that quality review, make sure you ask all of the questions to identify whether or not that data is actually producing actionable results. Is it providing specific guidance and answering the questions in the PIRs? Do they collect enough information? If you're short on information, got to add more sources or potentially your collection requirement isn't being met properly. Internal, external data, is it being collected and tailored in the proper way? Are you identifying the right sources? Um, again, are you getting the redundancy in your sources? If one of your sources is not providing good intel, is your redundant source to answer that question actually providing it? 
collection, make sure the finalized intelligence products are providing coverage across all of your priority intelligence requirements. When we first identified our priority intelligence requirements, for an example, we had eight. When we went through and were actually identifying each piece of threat intel that came through and categorizing it on our PIRs, we noticed that our last PIR never got hit because by the time we had made it through the first seven, everything had been categorized. So that PIR was sitting out there doing nothing. And it was causing us a lot of headaches because it looked at data across all verticals. So it basically opened the door for everything coming in. We had to eliminate it. It was, it was causing too much overhead on what we were trying to analyze. And all of our other requirements met it, so it wasn't necessary. Um, make sure that the obtained intelligence is in a useful format for the people that you're providing it to. I can't stress enough, strategic, tactical. If you provide tactical information to your CISO or a CEO or a board of directors, you're going to lose them. It's worthless to them because they don't want to know how that malware was reverse engineered. They want to know if they have a risk in their environment and whether it's going to affect them. Certain organizations have certain guidelines on how they produce or how they produce those reporting. Make sure you're following the guidelines for the organization. Some of the organizations like to see things in a certain format. That's how they're used to reading it. Try to adopt into those formats and how you do your reporting. Because if you get stuff that's familiar to them, they're much more likely to read it and ingest it properly. Any questions? So you have a, a bunch of things that come in. Do you act on every piece of intelligence you receive, or are you filtering that you know, with human work or with tools? So at this point, we're doing a lot of human filtering. However, we're starting to actually develop some automated processes that go in there. Um, I'll give you an example for our phishing mailbox. We have a mailbox. Anybody that thinks some, gets an email that they think is phishing, they can send it in there. That mailbox gets three to 400 messages a day. When we're doing a spam campaign, 12,000 a week. We have one analyst going through that mailbox. You know, when that comes in, we gotta pick that up. We're looking at ways to automate that. We're looking at ways to bring those emails out, strip out the headers, strip out all the IOCs, strip out the attachments, run them against reputation. Filter that out, get rid of all of that manual work because that opens up time for actually analyzing the data. Yeah, we're working on a lot of automation. And the other thing is, is getting to know your environment. Know who your vendors are. Know how your network is set up. Know your public IP addressing space. Know your internal IP addressing spaces. All of this information is valuable information for you to be able to take that data and know whether something's going to affect your environment or not. And it helps you identify those collection sources. Um, I do myself, yes. Um, that is not something that we have set up within the organization, simply because we don't have the manpower to handle that. Um, we're looking at some third party solutions to actually help out with that. Some of our threat and tell vendors actually provide some of that data for us. So we're at, we actually are constantly looking at, for new third party feeds to help augment that analysis for us because most threat intelligence groups don't have the manpower to do it all. You gotta rely on some other people to help you out. And that's where Isaac's come in also. Can you talk about some of your threat intelligence vendors? Um, maybe like your favorites and then maybe cost? I'll be honest with you, we're just in the process of evaluating all of them. Um, so right now I wouldn't be comfortable to tell you what my, my uh, favorites are at this point. Um, hit me up afterwards, I'll give you some information. You can contact me after that and we can talk offline. Yes? Um, like, at what point should a business start looking at this as in, like, size-wise? So if a business is, like, just very, very small, 
and only one person is just doing all the computer stuff? Or would it be like a couple of people that are on the IT staff that are just like doing this? That's a good question. And I can't give you a good answer for that. Um, before I went to Sutter Health, I worked at the University of Iowa Healthcare. Um, a number of the people in our group, we had a team of four. Everybody on that team was constantly watching open source stuff. So we were doing it, we were doing it ad hoc. We didn't have an actual managed process that we were doing it. Everybody in this room on any given day is actively going after threat intelligence. You're looking at news, you're looking at blogs, you're reading different sites, getting information on different phishing campaigns that are out, different vulnerabilities that are out. That's threat intelligence. You're all doing it every day. Most people just don't realize they're doing it. Do you have, maybe this is a sidebar thing too, but um, I also work in an organization that, that does phishing. Mm -hmm. So do you have any like dark web favorites where you go see if you see your company's name posted? Um, or do you, do you so, think you're going to rely on your threat intelligence? We, we actually are in the process of setting up some of our own dark web monitoring. Um, that's a long process. Um, it takes a long time to set up an actual vetted dark web presence. Um, most of the websites out there, you have to know somebody to actually get on it. Somebody's got to vouch for you to be able to get on and actually participate in that forum or that marketplace. So developing those personas, keeping them secret, it takes a long time to develop. At this point, we're mostly relying on third party vendors to do that for us. We're setting it up ourselves, but it's a long process. Um, there are a number of people within the different Isaacs who actually are actively doing this. And it's a really good source that you can reach out to some of those people because they're more than happy to help you out with that process as you go along. Um, but some of the open source things that we utilize, for example, Pastebin. I think everybody knows what Pastebin is. They offer an annual sale. You can get a lifetime membership to Pastebin for 20 bucks. That allows you 15 keyword searches. Those 15 keyword searches, infinitely valuable. Put in your organization's domain name. Put in different email aliases that you use. Anytime those come, things like that come up on Pastebin, it's gonna send you alert, you can go look at it. Um, I have a large number of accounts at this point. Because <laughs> 15 is not enough. Um, Sutter has about 300 different domain names that we monitor, so that gives you an idea. Yes, sir. Um, yes, so a lot of your threat intelligence platforms, for example, are going to give you a confidence level, and a lot of your threat intelligence feeds also will have a confidence level on that. Um, mileage is going to vary. They're going to they're going to score them differently. You're going to score them differently than what they're scoring them. Um, there are some of the stuff that we actually automatically ingest from our phishing mailboxes that when they go through the confidence scoring in our threat intelligence platform, it comes back at a 20 on a scale of a 100. All right, we need to do adjust that because we know it's active, it's attacking our environment, so that becomes a 90 or a 100 for us. Yes, yes. Um, we actually do risk scoring. Um, we have developed our own risk calculator, calculator that is worked in conjunction with our incident response team. So every threat, every piece of information that we analyze, we risk score that. And we risk score that based on a number of criteria as far as what type of threat it is, whether it's a direct or indirect, internal, external, um, what type of, uh, where it's at, for example, a kill chain process, where it's at in j just different models. So we use a couple different threat models, diamond, kill chain, a couple others that we're actually working on developing for our own internal environment and we map to those and we risk score based on that. What the projected impact is in threat intelligence. Incident response, we have a number. Threat intelligence, we gotta use some uh, estimations to figure out what we think the potential impact would be, and then we risk score it. At a particular 
risk score, we, it gets escalated immediately. Other ones, we just report on. Any other questions? Comments, feedback? All right, thank you. Yeah. This has become a very big conversation topic in the last two to four weeks within our environment because our incident response teams actually utilize who is passive DNS information for initial lookups on a lot of the things that they see. We utilize it in threat intel also. Um, with those changes, uh, those that aren't familiar, the Europe has passed their GDPR. Um, which is basically their individual privacy rights, which are kind of muddying up the water because a lot of people in the U.S. didn't feel that they were going to be subjected to those. But come to find out, it's kind of overreaching in that if you do business with a European entity or someone from Europe visits one of your websites, for example, you are subjected to G GDPR. And um, one of the things with GDPR is protection of the information on people who have registered domains. So that who is information that we utilize on every one of our domain and IP lookups to figure out where things are coming from and where they're going to, that information is going to start being hidden from us. Um, we're, we're still evaluating that. It, I, I don't know what the answer is, but yes, it's gonna impact us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we have entire vendors that are completely dedicated just to passive DNS information for us. Any other questions related to this or any threat intel questions at all? All right. Thank you all.